thank you for inviting me to speak about this beautiful exhibition today. I don't know about my speaking skills, I think the artists themselves are wonderful. They speak for themselves and hopefully I can just say a few words and then have the great pleasure of speaking to some of their family. I think it's very exciting just to see a, a show dedicated to drawing. It's one of the most marvellous expressive mediums that uh, humanity has created. And it's at the point in which we see the artists really um, all that uh, imagination or engagement with the world, that point on that page is that moment where it first comes to sort of this exciting um, uh, formation. And then the drawings can be used for different ways. And I think many of these drawings are in fact um, really like a, a rigorous form of self-training um, and um, sort of regular artistic exercise and also they're setting themselves problems to solve. So they're very exploratory and engaging just with that sense of the combination of the mental and the, the sort of the dexterity of the hand. At the same time we see certain interests of the artist emerge. You have always that remarkable piercing eye of Nora Heysen. You see it in that self-portrait and her interest in faces and people. I think on the other hand Constance Stokes always this extreme um, engagement with the idea of a, a sort of a wider decorative plane. And I think the way that Lorraine has set up this beautiful conversation between the two artists, where you see this very often rigorous structural um, uh, building of the figures upon this almost dramatic white ground, and then you turn to Constance and she has this lovely sinuous, often a meandering line, sometimes very calligraphic, and then you have these fantastic sort of invigorating washes that just set them all into this sort of spatial field and also provide this very beautiful sort of um, aesthetic decorative dimension. You're probably aware, and I do recommend the beautiful short essay that Professor Catherine Speck has written for the catalogue. Some of you will know um, Catherine Speck's written a lot about women artists and war artists and she also published the letters between Hans Heysen and his daughter Nora. So she knows them very well and I think she speaks very beautifully about the ambition of these artists. Both Constance Stokes and Nora Heysen go to Europe, they go initially to London. Constance Stokes wins the travelling exhibition, this great final year um, prize that the best students can secure and it takes them over to London and often they would then travel to France if they wished and that's what happened in Constance's case. Nora Heysen, on the other hand, very interesting, the son of the great Sir Hans Heysen, so very much aware of the um, sort of tradition and achievement of her father. But she herself, from a very early age, recognised as having this wonderful innate talent. She's trained initially in Adelaide, and then she goes up and she has a major show in, um, in Sydney. We have to remember she's um, uh, remarkable for being an early woman Archibald Prize winner. And on the success of her exhibition in London, her family are actually going over, her father, mother and, and um, some of her siblings, going over to London. But with those funds she's achieved from her exhibition in Sydney, she sets herself up to do further study in London. So we have this very dedicated, recognised for their innate talent, early training in Adelaide and Melbourne. And I think it's great to be reminded, often we think of Sydney moderns, we think of Cosmington Smith, but we've got to remember there's great female modernists here in Melbourne and Adelaide. In um, London, it's very interesting to see, we have Constance Stokes initially at the Royal Academy, working on a very interesting artist called William Mornington, who is a great decorative, does wonderful murals and these wonderful these big, um, bold, rather flattened canvases. But she decides to take herself to France, where she works with André Lote, one of those great Cubist teachers. Many Australians worked with Lote and you see that inheritance, that sort of, I think that's like that Paris school element that she brings back to Australia. Nora Heysen, on the other hand, very interesting. Kathy refers to her going to work in the London Central School of Art under Bernard Meninsky. We've got some beautiful works by Meninsky in the National Gallery of Victoria. He was a major teaching modernist figure of the day. And there's this rather poignant um, series of letters that Nora writes back to her father saying that her teacher had seen her early drawings. And you've got to remember she's had great success in Australia. She's seen as this rising talent. Bernard Meninsky tells her her drawings were lifeless, 
dull, formless and superficial, and she had to convert to his technique. And his technique was a very strong, bold line and then um, some sort of hatching around it. She'd had this very fine line and beautiful shading. So two different traditions. And you see her feeling quite crushed by this and then sort of deciding that she would be her own, her own person, follow her own line. She experiments with his tradition and then returns. And I think you see what's so beautiful about these works coming out of the um, family archives is we have them over a range of decades. And you can see certain you know, continuities in their way of working with the line, working with that wonderful, I always think with Heisen you get that lovely role of like a silhouette. If you think of her paintings, some of those great portraits with this sort of clear head and then this wonderful sort of luminous sky behind. And I think a similar thing happens with her drawings, this very beautifully structured figure and then the really um, expressive use of the page behind. But I must say also, Constance Stokes, very beautiful artist, much admired in her own day. She is included in major exhibitions of Australian artists that travel to um, London, 12 Australian artists, uh, one of two Victorian artists who go. In London, her work is praised very highly, Kenneth Clark. Back here in Australia, the first Herald um, Chair of Fine Arts of Melbourne, uh, Professor Joseph Burke. I always remember going to his room when I was a student. He had a Constance Stokes on his wall from the university collection. And he again was very admiring of her work and really um, uh, praised her. So I think both of them are remarkable figures. They're two artists who had the highest ambitions in their day of going overseas, getting all the best training and then really um, seeking an international standard of practice. Back here in Australia, they both maintain their careers, they marry, Constance Stokes has children, and they try to maintain their practice, always a, a difficult thing, are um, regarded, perhaps not the best known of artists, but are part of this revision of women Australian artists that's been going on for the last, say, 10, 20 years, in which just recently Lucilla's brought out a beautiful book on her mother, so people can actually see this remarkable artist's work, and Nora Heysen, both to do with her wonderful war work, she was a very early women war artist, and then just in her own right, her remarkable portraits and other work, has received some touring exhibitions. So I think a very exciting exhibition on a number of levels. One, just to see works coming out of an artist's archive. These are works they have chosen to retain. They're often student works, or then they're works in which they are clearly comparing their practice. They're an ongoing sort of dialogue they have with their own study and interests. And then um, we often find these are more exploratory works. I think the importance of artists' archives are being recognised more and more. We recently had the, National, the Art Gallery of New South Wales declare itself the National Art Archive. And they've now got the archives of um, Margaret Preston, Max DuPain, Margaret Olley, Roy de Maist. They're really trying to acquire these remarkable repositories of artists' works, sketchbooks and studies, because they tell us so much about how the artists actually created and the things that really drove them forward and the things that they returned to again and again throughout their life. So with those opening words, I thought I might um, turn to uh, Stephanie and Lucilla. We have the niece of Nora Heysen and we have the daughter of Connie Stokes. And I wondered if you'd like to perhaps, Lucilla, starting with you, talk a little bit about it bringing your mother's archive together, producing a book about her career, and what are the sort of messages about her you tried to convey to the public? Right, well, it all started when my brother died in 2013, and when I went to clear out the house, I found, to my surprise, cupboards full of letters, documents, drawings, sketchbooks. Her whole life was there in the cupboards, and I thought this I've got to do something with this because this wonderful artist has been ignored for too long. And um, so I got it all together and sat down to produce a book, managed to find the, a lot of um, images, which was not easy. Um, and during the course of this, I discovered that my mother had been leading two lives. All the time she'd been having a double life. As a child growing up with an artist, you think that's just my mother. And just like everyone else. And all that time, she had letters from galleries asking for works to be exhibited. She had letters of praise. She had newspaper clippings, hundreds of beautiful
beautiful newspaper clippings of um, reviews of her works. And so I managed to try and get it all together as best as I could to try and reinstate her, put her back where she really belongs in this world, in this art world. Um, and you did so a great job, I have to say. You did a terrific <laughs> job. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's been a challenge. Yeah, it's been a big challenge. I was going to say, Stephanie, I noticed they had on the, on the online um, biographies of Bachelor Art, there was one which said after she won the Archibald Prize, the Australian Women's Weekly published an article saying, Artist who wins the prize can also cook, and it had a series of her, of her recipes. And I wonder, do you feel, with a very distinguished father and the battle that women artists had, your memories of your aunt, do you feel she did struggle to, you know, really convey the professional dedication of her practice? Yes, well, uh, unfortunately, of course, I was very young when she, um, when, um, so I didn't have a lot of knowledge or interaction with my aunt, but I know she always felt she was under Grandad's, uh, her father's um, mm, shadow, shadow always, um, and um, she felt, of course, after coming back from England that she needed to strike out on her own, and so, of course, moved to Sydney. Mm. I sadly didn't see a huge amount of her, because I, you know, well, I, I was living in Melbourne always, and married and children. Well, I used to go up and visit every time. If I went to Sydney, I'd go and see my aunt. She lived in this amazing old shingle home in Hunters Hill with a, a, a refrigerator that I think had one of those kerosene <laughs> things, little pull-out things, and the stove was something out of 1930s. Incredible. She'd go out on a galley and she she would live there and there wasn't any space anywhere. It was all water, pictures or paintings just propped up against all the walls. My mum used to go up and stay with her and there'd be cats there. She always had a great passion for animals, so she'd adopt the local dog that would wander in and live with her forever or cats. And of course her flowers. But um, mm. I think also those, we've got some of her Pacific works, and I know yes. in the war she was up in Papua New Guinea, but then her husband was a doctor he of was tropical a, medicine. He was a professor of tropical yes. medicine. So you have this interesting Pacific element in her work into the 1950s, don't you? Yes, yes. She suffered terribly from dermatitis and um, things up, like yes. eczema, I think, in, the, in that heat up in New Guinea. Yes. And um, I think that was a constant worry for her. There was that lovely story where she had this beautiful arrangement of flowers. So she, I think it's called the Ship of Flowers or something. And she was painting it when the orders were given to move on. And she she said, no, no. I'm, you know, the, she was almost court-martialed, I think, but she stopped. <laughs> said, I'm, not, I'm going to finish my painting. Before they were all, the Australians were ordered to, you know, keep going. She was defying orders of the army. So. As a woman artist, she was given the particular task of imaging women within the yes. armed forces, wasn't she? She yes. had these fantastic images of driving, women trucks, driving trucks and operating, operating theatres yeah. and things. But they said that, you know, she followed her own path a bit. She was yes. a pretty decided character. Oh, yes. She didn't suffer fools gladly. I always think her self-portraits, you have that amazing. absolute laser gaze. And she, you really get a sense of that. So. Later on in life, she was mm. incredible. I mean, she smoked all the time, and she loved Scotch whiskey. <laughs> and I remember in, in her 80s, and mate, she'd say, "No, oh, I've been X-rayed. I don't have lung cancer." Mm, Why she <laughs> can't go? You wouldn't dare tell her not to smoke if you picked her up in your car. She wasn't to be. She wasn't to be told. No, but she was very. And she and my mother used to ring each other every Sunday when my mum was a, a <coughs> three years younger and lived in South Australia and Nora and they'd have a chat on the phone every Sunday night because they were the last two remaining girls in the family. I think the sense of the presence of these women, very dedicated. I know people talk about Connie Stokes and your mother was quite 
even shorter than I am. person, is that possible? But very, you know, absolute yeah. um, the, the sense of that creativity and really a remarkable career. We have her in the Venice Biennale. Yes, yeah, she was. Yeah, no, yeah, in the, the, the Travelling Scholarship. Yes. You know, she um, does sell-out shows later on when she really revives her career and powers forward. That's right. People love her that. work, don't they? They did. That was a sell-out. <coughs> And, uh, and, and among the artists as well, she, she had a lot of fans among her colleagues, um, a lot of fans. And she was actually one of the finalists in the, in the Arch Award in 35. Oh, how interesting. So that was quite something as well. Mm. Well, very early on, because she wins the Travelling Scholarship, part of its requirements for you to send works back and they've entered the collection. So from the sort of 1930s, some works of hers are going into the NGV. Yes. But you know, when she had works praised in London, quite a few of the more tonal artists back home rumblings about why we're making this fuss over this woman. And yet she had great, you know, Professor Burke, Kenneth oh, Clark, all these people yes, so Keith Murray, came out and claimed, you know, please look again at what she's doing with this sort of mm. classicism, but also with this very rich, I talked about her Venetian palette. Yes. Role of colour and classicism. As she went on, she I think her training with Andre Lote came more to the fore yeah. because she became more and more obsessed and interested in colour and the science of colour and how colours work one against the other and how to show form through colour. Mm. And her works look simpler, but I think a lot of artists seem to simplify their work as they get older. But it's perhaps it's just getting down to the bare bones. They they, they do away with all the unnecessary. <laughs> and get down to the bare bones, and I think that's what she did. I often think Cubism is such, we have a bit of a sort of masculine perspective when we think of someone like Picasso, but there's a whole line of female Cubists, yes. like I think Marie Laurencin, who the constant sits within that tradition yes. a bit. Yes. And I thought later in her life she looks at someone like Matisse. Well, These are, you know, the great decorative modernists that mm. she's sort of aligning herself with. Well, she was in a flat in Paris, uh, with Kislings and Matisse's and paintings all around the walls, the flat that they, the, the two girls were mm. renting in Paris. So she was there right at the, at the peak of the most exciting time in art, I think, really. I think we forget the constraints, even though it's sort of they're travelling. I mean, um, I think Constance was born in 1906 yep. and uh, Nora was born in 1911. In the 1930s, we think of this as a time when, yes, women artists are doing lots of things, but you were mentioning before she travelled, Constance travelled with a um, chaperone when she went over to London, and of course Nora's going with her family. Mm -hmm. It still was a big deal to get out on your own and be oh, a yes. professional artist. Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> was there anything else you wanted to perhaps mention to the people here today about the work from the wall? Um, yes, actually, you'll notice that a lot of these drawings have a wash over them or pastel over the, over the top of the drawing. And I know that she, as she got, she had a terrible back problem from standing in front of the easel all her life. She had a compressed spine and it caused her a lot of pain. She spent a lot of time sitting in her chair going through her drawings and picking poses that she particularly loved and going over them with pastel and turning them into works of art, turning them from just working drawings into works of art. Mm. So, Very interesting. Yes. So she used either pastel or watercolour, or you can see she's put washes on, and this one was, she's used the oil pastel with that. And well, I often think that just that sort of very calligraphic, almost ink line with a wash reminds me of someone like Rodin's drawings. Yes. And it's always that sense of almost figures turning in space. Yes. But yes. that very early drawing, just on that corner below, which is a 1930s work, where you can see the pen line and the cross hatching, she shifts from that much more sort of formal um, yes, construction to this wonderful sort of floating decorative yes. uh, spatial type yes. of presentation. Her, her passion was drawing. She just felt that she spent her whole life perfecting drawing and being able to create a form just with one line. <coughs> she didn't do multiple lines. She would do one line, she'd get the whole form and the solidity of the figure in that one line, which was quite spectacular. In some ways, I always feel it's almost like this universal feminine form, often reclining in constant stokes. But when you look at Nora Heysen, all those heads of those models are real people. Yes. You know, she never really generalises. They're very much the particular individual. Mm -hmm. And these wonderful little images of children and babies and you know, people from the Pacific, that extraordinary um, fascination with individual humanity which comes through in these. Mm -hmm.
They are, they're a beautiful dialogue, this exhibition, and I think we are very privileged to see it. So thank you very much. Thank you.